I chose this photograph as a centerpiece image, which reveals my aunt Thelma with her parents in her dressing room, not only because it conveys an experience that I will shortly narrate in my talk, but because of the moment of tenderness that the photographer has captured between a mother and her daughter. The function of the mirror in this picture is not only to register to us the location of the scene, it plays a double role as it places Louis Wigeder, Thelma's father, in the out-of-focus background, whose textures remind us of the artifice of reflections, images, and cinema, while the focus of attention is on the way two women interact in a very private moment. Thelma's mother, Ruby, is helping her daughter to powder her face before the performance. She gently holds her chin with one hand and with the other hand is holding the powder, Puff. Thelma appears to enjoy the attention from her mother. Not only is her mother's face now mirroring her own moment of glory and satisfaction of having become an actress, it also reflects the mother's pride in her daughter's success, especially when we consider that she too was an actress before she got married. At the age of four, she won a prize on the Sands in Blackpool performing at a place called Carlton's Cozy Corner. She was allowed to perform professionally from the age of 10. She was the fairy queen in pantomime and toured in variety as the dainty little Paula Ruby. In 1928, she appeared in the West End in a show written by Noel Coward and produced by the legendary C.B. Cochran called This Year of Grace. She then left the professional stage but starred in many musicals on the amateur stage. During her retirement, she compiled many family albums, among them photographs of herself and of Thelma in the theater. Thelma had phoned me to tell me that her mother would have been 120 a few days ago. As I approach retirement, I find myself also making a gesture of love and admiration for my aunt, who has reached the age of 96, by compiling more photos of her diverse career and wishing to celebrate it here together with all her friends who live in so many places in the world and with whom she has kept in touch all these years. The idea of writing my own experiences of viewing opera and other theatrical performances started from a memory of my visit to the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. My aunt, Thelma Ruby, had invited me to a dress rehearsal of The Marriage of Figaro, in which a close friend of hers was performing. After the noon performance ended, my aunt insisted that we remain in Covent Garden and go to the evening performance of Puccini's Turnadot, of which I knew but had never seen. But there are no tickets, I exclaimed. She brushed my skepticism aside and insisted that if we stood in the queue there would almost certainly be some return tickets available. After more than an hour waiting in the queue, I lost patience and was ready to leave. But again, my aunt persisted. Be patient, my dear. Have faith. Finally, I left the ticket queue, walked to the box office to see whether they had by chance any tickets left. The ticket seller offered me only two tickets that were still available at £10 each. This sounded ridiculously cheap and led me to wonder what was the catch. But they turned out to be neither standing room tickets nor restricted view tickets. They fell into a category that I had never heard of before. My jaw dropped in disbelief when the ticket seller explained to me that there was a complete blind spot from these seats so one could not see the opera but only hear it. I recalled my student days in London in the 1970s when I had seen student musicologists sitting in opera seats up in the gods where they were unable to see all the stage and were busy reading the opera score sheets and listening to the singing. After my initial surprise and having verified that the ticket seller was not pulling my leg, I thought that this offer could be a very interesting, attractive experience in the future. Would it not be fascinating 
to really listen to an opera from the upper circles with the excellent acoustics and with no distractions? Would it not turn the experience into a concert indeed? Would the sight of the rest of the audience attentively watching the performance be sufficient to feast my eyes, to feast my curiosity, even though I didn't see the stage? I recall the function that opera glasses played in countless scenes in novels and films about the 18th and 19th centuries, in which going to the opera is mainly depicted as a social event in which members of the high society pretend to be interested in opera but are mainly there to see and be seen and to mix with other members of their own class. Lingering literary descriptions reveal how the heroine of the story sits in the box and instead of looking at the performance, is busy engaged in indulging in physiognomy and dresses and looking at other members of the audience, which provides her with much material for social gossip. Finally, my aunt bought two exorbitantly priced tickets in two different rows, and we dashed into the theater just before the performance began. As we waited for the lights to dim, I was reminded of a visit to my aunt's dressing room in my childhood. Thelma was playing in Stop the World, I Want to Get Off with Anthony Newley at the Queen's Theatre in London in 62. My sense of privilege in visiting a part of the theatre to which the audience has no access was already felt when I reached the stage door towards the back of the theatre. There could be no stranger contrast between the front entrance of the theatre which conveys all the pomp and architectural splendor, and the stage door entrance, which is often narrow, dark, and even decrepit in all theater buildings, and where a gatekeeper is always there in a booth, which is frequently small and shabby. I descended a narrow, dark staircase and walked along damp corridors that gave me a sense of being led into a dungeon. The aesthetic appeal of such run-down old interiors is based on the simple fact that such stage door represents an entrance into the very bowels of the theater where the backstage machinery creates the illusion of the drama of the play, an illusion that must not be broken for the audience. For a child, the exciting part of such a visit was that of seeing my aunt transform into her stage character in the dressing room. A folding screen let her change her clothes into costume in privacy while still talking to me. A wig on the expressionless mannequin's head stood in readiness on her dressing table. Greeting cards from well wishes framed the border of a large mirror above her dressing table, itself framed by naked light bulbs. A bottle of port and glasses were placed on her dressing table, awaiting the guests who would come to congratulate her after the performance. The object that struck me most was an old loudspeaker that hung on the wall by the doorway and from which sporadic crackling sounds emanated. Its purpose was to let her know when it was time to go on stage, but it was also possible to hear the performance through it. I was immediately captivated and content to be left alone in the room while my aunt went on stage. The idea that I could be alone in a dressing room among the accoutrements, the makeup brushes, the boxes of powder, the costumes, and the mirror, while being able to listen to my aunt's performance through this loudspeaker, opened up an entirely new perspective for me. Instead of the usual frontal view of the stage performance, which is why audiences come to the theater, I had a more oblique and indirect experience. What was hidden from the audience was now visible to me, at the cost of not being able to see the play. In other words, the separation between sound and vision became acutely apparent. The play transformed into a soundtrack for me, while the experience of physically watching it became symbolically represented by the mirrored lights in the dressing room in which I could see myself reflected. None of these thoughts, of course, came up in my mind as a child. For me, as a young boy, this was a magical experience in which the dressing room served the function that attics play in literature, poetry, and life. 
They are spaces that are both part of the house but also separate from its daily usage and thus serve the purposes of retreat, daydreaming and imaginative reveries. Back to the performance of The Marriage of Figaro. After the performance ended, my aunt and I went to visit her friend, Helene Schneiderman, in a dressing room. We walked along a passageway close to the cafeteria in which a window was open in the wall to enable the passerby as a glimpse of the backstage below, where the props and the machinery were stored in preparation for an upcoming production. The view opened up a vista of memories on the desktop of my mind of similar views at the Israeli Opera House, which I had had the good fortune to visit many times, due to the generosity of John Brown, a close friend of mine who worked there. John had studied stage design in New York City. After his arrival in Tel Aviv, together with his wife, Ofra Confino, a successful theater costume designer in Israel, he worked for the Opera House as one of the chief stage design supervisors. One of his main responsibilities was to adapt stage designs that have arrived from abroad to the stage in Tel Aviv. For over a decade, he invited me to rehearsals and gala openings of countless opera productions, sometimes at a moment's notice, because he knew the pleasure I took in looking at them from so many diverse and unlikely angles. I enjoyed and learned from viewing opera singers sitting down on an empty stage, wearing casual clothes and holding paper cups of coffee while they sang famous arias, I enjoyed the light cue rehearsals in which singers sang informally, resting their voices for the coming gala performance. Hearing the singers rehearse on an empty stage with only a single piano accompanying them appeared to me to be the finest way of stripping opera of its mannerisms and focusing on the pure quality of singing. I especially enjoyed seeing rehearsals and performances from the wings through the wooden planks and sandbags that supported the scenery and which provided me, as a voyeur, with a contrast between the limited view I had of the singers on the stage and the magnitude of their immersive voices that could be heard everywhere. Seeing the singers pause in the wings just before they stepped onto the stage reminded me of the significance that areas of transitions play in our lives. Such spaces can be filled with dread, relief, beginnings and ends, as well as indecision, while also sparing us in our creative journeys. My own favorite angle for viewing an opera was one that I was only able to occupy twice. John had invited me to view the first act of Madame Butterfly from the highest tiers above the stage. It meant taking an elevator and reaching the top of the theater from which one had a bird's eye view of the performance through the lighting grids and the hanging scenery. Of all the oblique views that I experienced viewing on stage and off stage in the opera house, one in particular captured my imagination because it proved to be multi, multiplied, and various. It led me to a great appreciation of the stage manager who was responsible for everything running smoothly. This demigod stood by the wings opposite the decrepit trolley holding three small monitors, a tiny working light, and a sheet of music. One monitor showed him a close-up view of the conductor. A second monitor showed him a view of the audience from the point of view of the stage. And a third one showed him the entire view of the stage and its curtain from the direction of the audience. He was also able to see a side view of the live performance from the wings. And finally, he spent most of the time looking at the score sheet and turning the pages on which small yellow stickers marked his cues to the singers and the choir to come on stage and to cue the stage hands for the next scenery changes. 
Wow. Talk of multitasking. He was conducting the entire event in three time zones. The first was the real time in which the actual singers and technicians were performing and working on stage. The second was the unfolding of the fictional time of the drama that was taking place in another period of time, designated by the costumes and the set design. And the third time, represented by the note cues on the score sheet, represented the future, the future anticipated time when he would make his announcement quietly through the microphone attached to his headset in order to ensure that everything would operate correctly with no hitches. His work meant that he always had to be one step ahead while at the same time always remaining in step with the flow of the performance and the music represented by the score sheets. This multi-perspective approach reminded me of the significant role that John played in making it possible for the audience to watch the opera without being aware of what was going on backstage. During the final dress rehearsals, John walked around the auditorium and checked meticulously from every angle any possibility that the stage lights or the backstage would be seen between the gaps in the scenery. In other words, among many other things, he was responsible for maintaining the illusion of the open of the opera by covering any gap in the scenery with black drapes so that the audience could be fully immersed in the action and forget they were looking at the performance that had demanded a great deal of effort to be staged. Although I was not immediately aware of it at the time, the spatial memories that I have been relating here had a profound effect on my photographic sensibility. I preferred to photograph empty locations that were imbued with a dramatic character, in which the attention was focused not on the actions but on the setting itself. I had learned to look at places with one aim in mind. I wanted them to transmit the sense of being a stage doing an interval in a play. In other words, areas that were imbued by absence affected me more than those in which an action took place. I became fascinated by a world that reminded me, much later on, of one of the most beautiful descriptive passages in modern literature, in which Virginia Woolf describes the contents of a summer home by the sea that has continued to exist despite the fact that its owners have been away for over a year. Into the lighthouse, in a section titled Time Passes, the sound of the creaking staircase and the beam of light from the lighthouse has penetrated through the windows into the interior, revealing that this interior can continue to exist even when their owners are long gone. This perception has taken on an extreme in such animated films as Toy Story, in which objects in interiors come alive and communicate with each other especially after the inhabitants of the homes have fallen asleep or left. Both my aunt's dressing room and the privilege of being able to visit the backstage contributed to my developing in my photographic practice oblique forms of perception. I learned that if I turn my camera away from the direct and powerful drama that confronts me, I may find the periphery subjects to photograph that are far more interesting than those that are staring at me. In large festive street scenes and city parades, I focused on the crowds that were looking at the action rather than on the parade itself. In dramatic situations involving demonstrations and violence, I purposefully looked away from the action and searched for its representations in the surrounding area. I taught my students a simple principle. If a stone is thrown onto the surface of the water and creates a splash, no matter how beautiful its impact, don't photograph it. Instead, wait a moment and then turn to look at the ripples the stone has left on the surface of the water 
And it is there that you will find most interesting moments to record. For me, photography was not about capturing the decisive moment. It has been about focusing on the small delays in the action and its aftermath. My long adventures, Dre, together with Aunt Thelma, had come to an end. We boarded the last underground train to Wimbledon via Earl's Court. The late night passengers were rowdy. It was hard to find a seat. Finally, after a few stops, my aunt was able to sit down. I remained standing. During those moments when friends, couples and families are separated from each other in a train carriage because they are unable to sit together, another form of perception arises that has to do It has to do with our observing someone usually close to us from a slight distance among the anonymous crowd. In this respect, I'm returning again to this idea of the oblique view. We're together in a carriage. We are with someone very close to us. They suddenly sit away from us and we look at them from the distance among so many people that we don't know. And at a certain moment, they could either stand out or they can turn into one of the crowd, one of the anonymous crowds. We toy with the thought of how we might have perceived them if we had not known them. Perhaps we suddenly question our friendship and love for someone we know, or we may feel a sudden surge of closeness and love. We may see them unexpectedly for whom they truly are, independently of our particular vision and relationship to them. It was Marcel Proust who characterized the photographer as a stranger when his narrator visited his grandmother's home. On his arrival at the doorway of the drawing room, she was not aware of his presence. And for the first time in a flash of recognition, he did not see her for the woman he imagined and loved so much since his childhood, but for what she now actually was an elderly, dejected woman who was all alone in her home. This was the function of the doorway view in which he stood, half in and half out of the room, in the corridor. But of course, all this changed once he, she noticed him and they started to talk together in the room. I glanced around the underground carriage in which we found ourselves on the last train to Wimbledon. My own gaze rested now on my aunt, who was busy observing the passengers with her usual inimitable curiosity. Looking at her from the side led to the following idea, to the following thoughts, to the following reveries. Did the child who had come to visit her backstage ever anticipate? What a close friendship they would form later on in life. Was this not truly a privilege, a great privilege? Having lost parents and with only my aunt to attest to a lost generation of my closest relatives, was I not lucky to have someone who could still attest to the time I was born? Was there not a correspondence between the child who felt the privilege to enter the dressing room and be on the guest list at the stage door? And this moment in which I could still be someone's nephew and maintain something of the child in me? I looked at her with admiration and knew for a fact that I could never reach her age in the same manner. Would any one of the passengers who could see her sitting and holding a walking stick believe all that she has done today? That in her 90s she has driven to Southfield Station this morning and parked the car? We had taken two trains to Covent Garden and then came back? We had spent more than six hours at two opera performances with several intervals in one day? She had invited me to lunch and after we had left Turner Dot after 11 p.m. at night, 
She had insisted that we have supper at a restaurant she liked in the West End. After we have, had arrived back at Southfield Station, she once again drove back and parked the car in the garage. And if that wasn't enough, she offered me an alcoholic nightcap after one in the morning so that we could recap our adventures that day. After more than 15 hours on the move and sitting through two operas, I was utterly exhausted, while she remained perky and wanted to recap and talk and talk and talk and talk. How could I keep up with her energy? As I sit in my study writing down these memories during the COVID-19 lockdown, while the theatres have been closed for much of a year, I thought again of the sounds of the performance filtering through the speaker in my aunt's dressing room. While I consider myself essentially visually orientated, I've also become more aware of sounds. I always mention to my film students the words of the French director Robert Bresson, a true poet of the cinema, who advised that wherever possible, it is better to replace an image with a sound, because sounds trigger our imagination and are far less literal than pictures. The idea behind this was that, for example, if a person walks in the street and looks at a church, if you see the church bells, you're not going to hear the bells. But if you have a person standing in the street and you don't show his point of view, but you hear in the soundtrack church bells, then everyone in the audience can imagine an image of a church, which would be much better than the actual image the director can show on the screen. I want to end by offering a random set of acoustic associations that have arisen in my mind. The sound of people greeting each other in the foyer of the theater, which provides a sense of anticipation for an event that is about to take place. The sound of an orchestra practicing before the conductor arrives. The dying sounds of chatter that appear to be synchronized with the slowly fading light in the theater auditorium that ends with the audience's silent anticipation of the performance about to begin. The sounds of hands clapping for the conductor when he enters the pit but is not yet visible on the podium. The sound of metal rings of a heavy curtain being drawn across the auditorium doors by the usher after the last theater goes have entered before the show begins. The ghostly sounds of an opera choir singing off stage, filtering into the theater from the invisible beyond. The silence in the theater bar that makes it possible to hear the chinks of glasses and plates being laid out on small tables just before the auditorium doors open and the audience spills out during the intermission. The applause of a satisfied audience, especially when given to a singer who has played a minor part and not to the lead role. The beeping sounds of mobile phones being turned on as the audience prepared to leave the theater. The sounds I will always want to hear after leaving a theatre in London. The bustling metropolis produces the sounds we listen to with our bodies, even if we are not actually conscious of hearing them. Mind the gap. Mind the gap being called out in the London underground before the doors of the train slide shut and the way the poet T.S. Eliot introduced the vernacular language into modern poetry when he used the phrase that designates the closing hours of the pubs in one of the most famous 20th century poems. Come along now, please. Come along. Come along now, please.